Hi there, come on in. You know, I mentioned on last week's show that we were gonna have our spring smelt dipping story. Well, you know what the weather's been like. It's been terribly cold. The salmon have been moving in the shallows after those smelt though, so we're gonna have a substitution and bring you our spring salmon story on tonight's show. We're also going to bring you, well, we'll look a little ahead. Last year we went smallmouth bass fishing with Bing McClellan on an opening weekend. Oh, that's some great action there. And we're going to bring you a recipe for smelt. You're gonna love it. Smelt broccoli casserole. It's terrific. So stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Outdoor Heritage. Detroit Red Wing hockey star Dave Barr is this year's honorary chairman of Chuck Muir's River Crab Charity Salmon Tournament at Port Huron, Michigan. Salmon are in shallow water right now, feeding on smelt. The video screen on the charter boat shows a big school of smelt congregated over a drop-off. And just eight hours earlier on a TV screen, we saw the Detroit Red Wings, unfortunately also over a drop-off. There's only one sport that thrills me close to hunting and fishing, and that's hockey. And I am totally thrilled right now up here at the River Crab pre-publicity tournament the day after the final playoff game for the Red Wings, unfortunately, is Dave Barr. I am thrilled to meet you. Nice to meet you, Fred. I'm just a total Red Wing hockey fan, me and my family. And uh, you, how did you get here? I mean, we watched you on television last night at 11.30. Yeah, well, we uh, we charted out right after the game, and I got in at uh, about 3.30, and uh, uh, the fishing was started at 5.30, so I, uh, I just thought I must as well stay awake. Holy cow. You're that avid of a fisherman? Well, I enjoy fishing. I uh, I uh, somewhat committed myself to the tournament. I told him if, you know, if we won mm -hmm. in five or six games, I'd be able to make it here. Unfortunately, we lost in six games, so I, I thought I should show up anyways. Well, I tell you, the Red Wings have nothing to be ashamed of though I mean you gave the fans a year of hockey that was incredible yeah well we, we gave it our best uh, unfortunately things didn't work out for us uh, Chicago played extremely well against us and uh, and their goalie made some you know, you know played some oh, super yeah. games against us we could talk on and on and on about the hockey season but let's just talk a little bit about fishing now what are your plans now that the season is over you live in Michigan I stay in Detroit year-round I have a boat and I enjoy fishing uh, wherever I can. I usually out in Lake St. Clair or uh, in the Detroit River someplace trying to uh, dig up some fishing holes and uh, I get out there usually about four or five times a week. Super. What, what about the other Red Wings? Is there any we have some uh, other guys in the team that are avid fishermen. Glenn Hanlon is uh, an excellent fly fisherman. He, he fishes back in British Columbia mm -hmm. uh, during the summertime. Rick Zombo, uh, who's from Chicago, has fished uh, a lot in Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota, and he, he really enjoys bass fishing. And, and we have Chris King, who's from Peterborough. He's also a, a bass fisherman. He fishes quite a bit. Great. Any chance that we could get you fishing with us this summer? Fred, I was hoping you'd ask me that because, uh, oh, I'd love to. I'll I mean, answer your questions about outdoor things, but we got to talk about hockey while we're fishing a little bit. I'm uh, this just, if there was one change I'd make in my life, folks, I'd be doing, I'd be playing hockey <laughs> instead of holding a fishing rod because. But Fred, uh, I've seen you skate, so I, I know now I know no, why you've gone to fishing. Oh, you haven't <laughs> seen me skate, Dave. Looking forward to it. Okay, we're going to get fishing with this guy, and best of luck on the tournament. I know it's raising a lot of money for a good cause. Yeah, it's a, it's a super cause, and I mean, plus you get to fish. Dave Barr and the River Crab Tournament could raise $100,000 to fight child abuse in this weekend Salmon Classic, a tremendous cause. Most of the successful boats will probably be using planer boards, sometimes called skis, to carry their fishing lines away from the sides of the boat. These planer boards are tethered to the boat with a heavy cord. And on these heavy lines, the captains run sliding clips that pinch the fishing line. The planer board lines hold the fishing line maybe 50 feet off to the side, and it's not unusual for the lure to be 100 to 150 feet behind that. Most of the fish at this time of year are caught off the planer boards. This time of year, we've got to get some lures a long ways back in the water, away from the boat. Reason for the long lines is that the fish are close to shore in shallow water chasing smelt and they're spooked by boats and motors. That's why our lines were set at sunup. Cold fronts have plagued the Great Lakes this spring. Smelt dipping has chilled out and salmon action has cooled off. 
But for a few minutes, our lines were hot. Three fish on at once. Jim Gillen battled this one. I worked the rod in the middle, and neither of our fish were very big. But Bill Parker, outdoor writer for the Eccentric Observer newspapers and Woods and Waters News, had a good size king salmon on. Oops, oh, my fish got tangled in Bill's line and threw the hook. Captain Rob Helzer grabbed the lure and cut it loose. Now you notice the wind and waves are picking up just a little bit. That's spring weather. When the wind moves the water, it changes the fishing, blows cold water in shallow, warm water out deeper, and that changes fish behavior from day to day. King salmon that'll weigh 20 to 25 pounds this fall weigh half of that right now, and that's what we have coming to the net. Hold it, Jim, over there a little bit. Another coho. Cool hole. Now that isn't the big one. This is a small coho, also about half the size it would be by the end of the summer. Bill Salmon eased up and started swimming to the boat. He's on there, coming with me. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You got in there? Okay, you can swim it right over here in the middle. Now watch that line. Come over behind me. Right over here. Come over here. Yeah. Okay, pull, up, pull up, pull up. Don't whine. Just pull. One more time for his guy. Right? Oh, there's a nice star. Nice. Yeah, that's a nice king. In the spring, these fish are silvery in color, their flesh is firm, and you won't find any better tasting salmon on the grill than these spring salmon from the Great Lakes. But this king salmon bears a wound that fisheries biologists fear will become more common if the federal government doesn't keep up its fight against the sea lamprey. They sap the life from the Great Lakes fishery in the 1950s, and sea lampreys are showing up again in larger numbers. Yeah. Is that your first coho salmon? Or yep, sure is. Try the little gill plates. All right. I'll, I'll take, take that one. Heck yeah. That's lick a it. Nice one. Lick it. <laughs> well, Bill Parker learned how to catch a salmon, and he also learned that a big body of water can change its disposition in a matter of hours. No matter how calm it is in the morning when you go out, keep in mind that just as fishing runs hot and cold, so does the weather. Those are Mother Nature's rules for spring fishing. So if you go, be sure to play it safe. Steven Sunderland of Waukegan, Illinois, used a nightcrawler to catch this Gogibic County one pound, three ounce, 11 and three quarter inch bluegill. Another fish caught on a nightcrawler is a six and a half pound largemouth caught by Edward Seacole of Traverse City in Leelanau County. Tracy McCormick of Ortonville caught a 17 and a half pound trophy channel catfish on a pike minnow in Iosco County. A jig in Rapala through the ice was how John Dumbra of Saginaw took this 10 pound 14 ounce walleye from the Saginaw River. Casey Rose of Marquette is holding his dad Carl's Dickinson County 21 pound 10 ounce gobbler that had a 10 and a quarter inch beard. Bruce Waldron of Alma was hunting the second day of the gun season and decided to put some scent out before he sat down. Now listen to what happened. So I get out my little body, bottle of Foggy Mountain and I shake it up and I get my cotton ball out. I open the top and I squirted it and the top blew off and blew all over my arm. So I tried to wipe off as much of it as I could. And so while I'm wiping it off, I just happened to look up and there he was. And he was coming at me, so I better poke him before he tries to get me. Do you think he was coming after that scent? I tell you, he was coming at me at a, at a fast walk, his nostrils were flaring, and I caught him at 33 feet away. I went back this morning and measured it to make sure. 33 foot. Do you know what he would have done if he would have caught up with you? He wouldn't have caught up with me. <laughs> That's how Bruce Waldron of Alma got his 11-pointer and his title of being the Michigan Outdoors Trophy Deer Hunter of the Week. 
Michigan Duck Hunters Association members have brought back wild celery tubers from Wisconsin. Almost 25,000 of them will be planted in Wildfowl Bay this Saturday. Planting should help bring back numbers of diving ducks. Early reports from the turkey opener are that the wind and rain kept success down. Cadillac District biologist Tom Havard had only checked in seven birds by 1.30 on opening afternoon. A bill to make sturgeon poaching an expensive crime has passed the House. The bill, sponsored by Representative John Pridnia, calls for a 90-day mandatory jail stay and $1,500 and restitution. This week is Wildfire Prevention Week. 80% of the wildfires in Michigan last year were started because of carelessness. That amounted to 12,000 preventable fires. There's a plan for an expanded turkey hunt this fall. The plan would authorize a hunt in areas of the UP, Northern Lower, and Allegan with almost 6,000 permits available. Free fishing days are coming up again this year on the weekend of June 10th and 11th. Anyone can fish without a license anywhere in Michigan. <laughs> I'm not sold on the premise that catch and release across the board is the only way to save fishing for the future. Too many anglers like to eat what they catch and in some cases it's just good conservation to remove smaller fish. Like thinning out a garden, the remaining ones grow better. With the larger predator fish like bass, pike, walleye and trout, there is often a surplus of the smaller ones who may remain small if they have to compete with each other. It's the big trophies that reproduce in the spring that need protection and they are protected in many areas. One walleye over five and a half pounds in Saskatchewan is the rule. Minnesota says only one northern pike over 24 inches. Missouri has an upward limit on bass in some lakes, as does Ohio. And there are fishing camps in Ontario that let you keep one trophy fish of each species during your stay, but you're welcome to eat the small ones while you're there and even take home a limit of the smaller ones. Now I like this trend of catch and release for undersized fish and the big spawners, but for the average size eaters, I'll always be sold on catch and fillet. Which is better, bat or man-made radar? Bat sonar or echolocation is superior to man-made systems. Thousands of bats can safely navigate in underground caves. Bats can separate insect echoes from background noise, and they can detect prey at ground level, something radar systems have great difficulty doing. The Osable Valley Turkey Federation chapter is holding its hunter workshop on Saturday at Fairview. Chuck Muir's Salmon Stakes Tournament is also on Saturday at St. Clair. There's a hunter safety course all weekend at the Chief Okemos Sportsman's Club at Diamonddale. Handgun silhouette shoots are on tap Saturday and Sunday at the A.P. Goodrich Rifle and Pistol Club in Alma and the Barry County Conservation Club at Hastings. The Jackson County Outdoor Club is holding a 3D archery shoot Sunday only at Jackson. There's a Ducks Unlimited Banquet Thursday, April 27th at Sault Ste. Marie. Sunday, May 7th is the new date for the Outdoors Forever Wild Game Dinner at the Masters Restaurant in Madison Heights. Fred Trost Hunting and Fishing Museum will have stream trout videos running continuously this weekend that's located a block north of the State Police Post on Old 27 at Houghton Lake. And don't forget the Outdoor Fair, June 23rd, 24th, and 25th at Houghton Lake. And there's plenty for the family to see and enjoy at the fair, and fishing ought to be great that weekend. Hope you can join us for all the fun. If you missed a number, you can get it by calling the Michigan Travel Bureau, toll free on Friday during working hours. Fishing right now, because of the weather, is quite erratic. But in another oh, month or two, especially around the 1st of June, we're going to have some phenomenal fishing in Michigan. For example, smallmouth bass. Take a look at the first week in June for us last year. The boat we're going to be fishing from, well, it's a small boat, a small bass boat. We're going to fit four of us in here. And of course, that angler has the luxury of fishing by himself. He's probably trolling for walleye off the drop-offs, but we're going to be fishing the shallows around the edges of this lake. You can see dark patches of weeds, and we'll see light patches of the bass beds and bluegill beds. Bob Garner, Bing McClellan, and myself, along with John Ford, cameraman, working the shores using primarily a bait that Bing's company makes. He's the president of Burke Flexo Lures. They make flexible lures. 
like these, they call them wigwags, sort of a twister tail. There's a, a number of products on the market like this, the flexible plastic, which imitate various baits. This imitates a minnow. That flexible tail wiggles in the water. It doesn't stay curled like that when you move it. It attracts a lot of fish, little fish. Pull it a little quicker and the tail straightens out and wiggles. And it really attracts the bluegills in the shallows. Look at them all chasing it. They'll grab it, they'll nip at the tail. Of course, that soft plastic probably feels more like a fish and they'll nail it time and time again. Of course, we're not after fish this size. We're after the bigger ones. We're after smallmouth bass, a cousin of the bluegill, and this one is guarding its nest. See it right in the bed? Yeah, right off the see, him, see him come to it? Yeah. See him walk, walk. See him walk. <laughs> See him? Just move it out of the way. He just took it off the bed. I didn't set those because I want That's it. what but the smallmouth do, do when anything comes near their nest. They're guarding it to chase it away. Now, this is not the female bass. The female lays the eggs and she goes over the drop offs, goes out into deeper water, lets the male guard the nest. What Bing is doing here, he's throwing one of his his larger plastic lures at it, something a little bigger to really intimidate that bass. He doesn't like it near his nest, and he moves it away, picks it up with his mouth, and moves it away. Now, on one hand, this makes these bass easy to catch. But on the other hand, they don't always, they, they, they don't swallow it. They're not looking to eat very often when they're on the beds. They want to pick it up and move it away. Watch this. Go pick it up. There he goes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> See what I can do with He it. moves it off the bed. We're just trying to see what that bass will do, how much of this it can take. You know, so many fish spook in shallow water. They spook in clear water. But when a fish is guarding a spawning bed, it becomes very adamant about guarding those eggs. Ah. There's so many things that can go in after it. There, I just yeah. cast one of the little wigwags, and he picked it up. I tried to set the hook. Couldn't do it. Now, this is a little too far away from the nest. So oh, Mr. Right. Smallmouth moves back in to guard it. There's a wigwag. Yeah. Let's see if, now nah, that's right on the bed. So he's going to pick it up. Yeah. At least knock it out of the way. The male bass guards these beds and they're very vulnerable to fishing. I mean, they are, they're a real sucker for a bait or a lure. And so often they get hooked. There he goes. With the seat he had in his mouth. Mm-hmm moves it away, sets it aside. But they're very vulnerable to predation. They're not even intimidated by the repeated casting of the lure and repeatedly moving that bait out of there. But when we move the boat closer, we get within 10 feet, the bass starts to back away. But he doesn't want to leave the area. Now, if this bass is removed from this bed, no other bass will come in and guard it because that's his bed and the eggs have a likelihood of being eaten by other fish. Now, there's a number of other fish that will come in and prey on these, and here we have some suckers working the shallows over beds where probably the bass have been removed. Kept the other day. Yeah, you, you see there's almost seven bass beds in there, all at once. Mm -hmm. But those are all suckers, and they're in there eating the eggs that the, somebody's been in here catching the buck bass, the, the male bass, off of the beds. Boy, oh boy. That happens. Like Here, Bing ties into a smallmouth, though. That's, well, he, he's into catch and release fishing. Always has been because he enjoys catching him. Taught me something about this that I didn't know. Now, I'm going to show you something that you may not know on how to land bass, smallmouth in particular. If you can zoom in or, or get this, yeah, I will. I'm going to have to sit there, Bob. Right? What he's going to do is pick this bass up and paralyze it. Oh, just lift it up underneath that. It's paralyzed. No kidding. Absolutely paralyzed. What you've done is force his entrails up into his central nervous system, which runs along the spine, and you paralyze him. Well, can you do that again? Put him back in the water and get Oh, him? sure. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Take it off. Yeah. And you bring him back in. What you have to do is not squeeze him. You have to simply hold him. On the bottom, lift him up. That's all. I'll be down. Just hold. Isn't that something? I never knew you could paralyze a bass by picking it up gently from the belly. 
always learned the lip method, and that paralyzes a fish too, holding it by the lower lip. But this, this was amazing discovery, which I tried on every fish I caught. It doesn't work on the real small ones, but here's, here's a largemouth bass we caught in a shallow area of a little warmer water. I tried the same thing with this bass, and it works. I don't know where he came from. He must have been at the edge of those beds. Yeah, he just exploded. Now he's not ready to call it quits yet. Boy, look at the bluegill, John. Yeah. Pan up and look at the bluegill right there. C oh, coming yeah. in after him. You can see him just thick in the water there. Yeah. Just thick. Well, I'll try this oh, new method. He's big enough to belly land. Sure. There we go. I tell you, I can't believe it, Bing. I just can't believe it. I couldn't I believe that. It worked on every single fish we tried, the larger ones. Uh, a bluegill, it really won't work, but the, the bass, he, Bing says it works on walleye. A number of species where the weight of their body pushes the entrails up against their backbone and paralyzes them. And you can release them, <laughs> ready to be caught again. When fishing is this easy and this much fun, even I will put off catch and fillet for another day. William Wiswell has sent us a smelt broccoli casserole, which is kind of different way to oh, use pe smelt. People at home are just going to say, oh, no, that, no, that's a terrible combination. That's you're not ruining what you the do smelt. With, you know, they think that you should start off like that, putting butter in a frying pan and then dip the smelt, roll them in seasoned flour, and fry them. Yep, but this is different. We're going to make a white sauce here. This is not for frying the fish in. And this is just your basic white sauce. And if you didn't want to do it this way, you could use any of the cream soups. Cream and mushroom soup would work uh, fine. Yeah, but this is fancy. This, yes. Butter, flour, salt, and milk. And then let that thicken. Milk. And then add Parmesan cheese hmm. and lemon juice. And you could use fresh lemon here, too, if you wanted to. And then the only other seasoning in this is dill weed. Dill weed. And just a little bit of it because it will overpower everything else. And, and then that's your white sauce that's that you your add basic the broccoli white sauce. to. Yep. Well, this is just basic, like a basic broccoli sure, dish. Sure, exactly, like a broccoli casserole. But Bill Wiswell calls for canned smelt, home canned. Right, not frozen and not fresh. And it's because it does give it a texture of like tuna fish here. Hmm. It's just a different texture, and it's all cooked that way. And then that goes in, and then it goes finishes baking in the oven. Smelt is, smelt is such a delicate fish. Very delicate. A, you know, you, it doesn't have a strong taste at all, so it's going to be interesting to see how this tastes. So you, what, finish it in finish the oven? Finish it in the oven, right. You know, Bob Garner is one of these guys who says there's only one way to cook smelt, and that is to fry it. So see what he says. This is, this is really good smelt. I'm not saying that... I'm going to have some more. Well, one of the things we can't show, though, every time is a new way to fry smelt. That's it's basically right. all the same. And so if you're going to have a lot of meals of smelt, this would be a great different way to have it. Very good variation. And can. They, once you can it, you can do anything with it. Boy, oh, I tell you. You know what amazes me? It What's doesn't that? taste like tuna fish. No. It doesn't taste like salmon. It isn't strong. It doesn't taste like sardines. No. No, but, not like I thought the canned would. No. But fresh mm. smelt themselves mm. aren't very fishy, no, so they to aren't. speak. Oh, no, so. they're no. very, very mild. And you know what else I like? This is really crazy. I like the bones in it. <laughs> that are real soft. Yeah. I like to eat gristle and chicken and stuff. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. You know, I really, I, this is phenomenal. We found two great recipes, one for canning them and one for preparing them once they're canned. It's <laughs> great. great. It's a winner. You probably won't find canned smelt in the store, but the recipe for canning fish and tonight's recipe for smelt broccoli casserole are both in the current issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine, along with all the recipes for March and April. And there's a page which covers the topics for the upcoming shows. If you catch a trophy, the Digest has an entry form. For the Stroh's Hunting and Fishing Awards, it's free to enter, and a copy of the new March-April issue is also free for the asking. It features color on nearly every page, an array of articles on hunting, fishing, and shooting, as well as wildlife art, sporting knives, and wild game cookery. So, you want to know why we didn't run our smelt feature this week? Here's the problem, the smelt are scarce. In the UP, not a word, none yet. Uh, we did hear a favorable report from the uh, Singing Bridge area about a week ago. For one night, it was hot. 
for two people we heard went out there and dipped smelt and there hasn't been hardly a thing since. It's starting at Gross Eel, we've heard. They haven't shown up at St. Clair River, haven't started on the west side to speak of, a few here and there, but uh, that's just been a mystery. That also affects the fishing for salmon, not so much for steelhead. The steelhead in the rivers, they're getting two and three. Emil Dean says they have a fresh run in the Manistee, getting a few browns around the perimeter here of Michigan, but uh, oh, limits of jacks in the southwest. But over in the St. Clair River, where the river crab tournament is, it has been tough pulling. And I think the problem is the cold weather sort of turned the fish off, the smelt, and the coho and the Chinooks that have been chasing them. Walleye, look at this, limits of walleye, four to six pounds, Detroit River behind the Edison plant. Up here in the Upper Peninsula, they are getting limits of coho in the Keweenaw, but throughout most of the UP, the water is too high from the runoff. Take a quick look at uh, the turkey hunting. Well, this year, it's gonna be better than ever. We have a great story coming up next week. Lots of big gobblers being taken, lots of turkeys throughout the state, three new areas that opened in southern Michigan. Morels, Larry Lonick reports morels. This weekend, south of Lansing, should be starting. So if the weather is bright, get outdoors. It's a great place to be. See you next week. And cars and trucks that are the heartbeat of America's great outdoors. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we're going to deliver a feature that we've been trying to do for years, and that is bring you a successful, realistic turkey hunt. Last Monday, Bob Garner had the luck of a lifetime with cameraman John Ford right behind him. At the break of dawn, there were several flocks of turkeys working in on him. Well, to make a long story short, you're going to see it next week, an exciting turkey hunt right here on public television.